coast for these particular societies, but sometimes also far away um, from where the original epidemic is. Now, before talking about are we ready, the next epidemic, let me briefly mention a few of the epidemics that have been occurring uh, in uh, this century, and uh, because they, each of them represent some, uh, some particular aspect. <coughs> um, the first uh, big epidemic or new epidemic was uh, called SARS and that stands for um, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, some abbreviation, and that hit uh, Eastern China, Southeast China and Hong Kong particularly. And it, uh, uh, you can see here, it killed, this was in, in 2003, the beginning of the year. Uh, in a few months' time, um, you know, uh, it, it was responsible for 3,500 cases and killed several hundreds of people. Now, what is particular there is that um, it caused some panic because it was a new virus. We didn't know where it came from. Um, and um, it hit the, uh, the headlines here. But what's important to know is that when, whereas most of the cases uh, occurred in Hong Kong, you can see here, and in uh, China, but China's big, but Hong Kong, overpopulated, densely populated, uh, spread of um, the virus uh, in apartment buildings and hotels and so on. But one of the things that happened is that a uh, businessman flew from Hong Kong to Toronto, here in, the, in Canada, and in Toronto uh, gave rise then to uh, about over 100 uh, cases of whom about 30 died. So that's the difference with the world uh, uh, 100 years ago that you can, you know, you can have a problem today and, you know, take Hyderabad, you have an international airport, you can fly from all over and, uh, you know, someone can, can arrive here or the other way around and uh, come uh, with a new virus. Uh, something similar happened with um, another new virus, which is called MERS. MERS stands for Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. This is a virus of the same family, um, coronavirus, for those who are, are into uh, virology. Uh, coronavirus, um, it, and uh, it's a virus that um, the, the, the host that it, from which, from whom. Um, people are infected are camels. It, 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 it's occurring particularly in the Gulf where there are lots of camels, uh, but lots of connections with, uh, with India, particularly with the west and southern part of the country. And here also, again, one day, a businessman flew from Abu Dhabi to Seoul, to Korea, and um, this is what happened. One person went from, first of all, from one medical center to another because he didn't feel well he felt that he was not well uh, treated in one center, so I did some what's called a medical shopping in Korea, and um, and then infected through coughing uh, lots of people, causing about 50 deaths. And uh, it was also uh, in the intensive care units of the uh, of these hospitals that a lot of transmission was occurring. And indeed, in many of these these viruses, it's the healthcare workers that are the, the first line of the uh, Third epidemic this, uh, um, this century, that was new, was an uh, epidemic of the so-called Zika virus. Um, and uh, you're welcome to stay as far as I'm concerned. But, uh, um, the um, Zika is a virus that was discovered in 1947 in Uganda, a country in East Africa. By the way, it's uh, by the Uganda Virus Research Institute, which is part of uh, the Medical Research Council in, uh, unit there, part of the, um, uh, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And uh, this was a virus that was a virus without a disease and looking for it. Because there are many viruses that don't cause disease, we don't know. Uh, certainly no disease in humans. And, um, and it was uh, detected here and there in the world. Um, and um, we, um, 
you know, uh, even in some cases in Pakistan, in VAD3, but without any clinical significance. Until there was a big epidemic in Brazil, in Brazil when hundreds of thousands of people were infected with Zika virus. Zika is the name of a forest in Uganda that they gave the name. <coughs> and what it did was uh, something very sad in Brazil, and that is that if you're pregnant and you're infected with Zika virus, particularly during the first trimester, uh, your uh, baby um, will have very severe neurological syndromes, including what's called microcephaly, in other words, a small head. Um, and um, this is, uh, gave rise to a, a very, very dramatic uh, epidemic. But here we have a completely different type of virus. The previous viruses were transmitted through, you know, are airborne, and you can catch on the bus to say so, or so you're in an elevator with someone. Um, but here it is in the same category as um, viruses like dengue, uh, which are, um, you know, affecting um, this part of the uh, of the country quite regularly. <coughs> Epidemic zone. This is an old uh, slide, but. Uh, um, the whole world now is affected by dengue. And it is, um, these are viruses that are transmitted by mosquitoes. And in the case of uh, Zika, dengue, chikungunya, there are cases now also here in India, um, of uh, yellow fever, they're all transmitted by a mosquito called um, Aedes aegypti. And Aedes is a tiny mosquito and uh, you can see where it is distributed over the world. And because of climate change, an increase of the uh, temperature, this um, mosquito now is spreading um, more and more also in areas that uh, until recently uh, were not uh, part of their natural habitat. And so here you see how um, climate change um, is not only uh, affecting uh, the environment, uh, agricultural production uh, produces heat waves with mortality and so on, uh, increases pollution, but also will affect the spread of um, infectious diseases, particularly those that are uh, spread by uh, mosquitoes. Um, and then a virus that probably very few have heard of, but um, and that has not caused big epidemics, but is of relevance here in uh, you know, here in India, at least, and that is so-called Nipah virus, first recognized uh, about 20 years ago in Malaysia among pig farmers, because pigs were the source of it, but it's actually another virus that is uh, uh, are living peacefully, to say so, in bats. Um, there have been periodic cases in, um, in this part of, uh, uh, of, the, of the country, but uh, last year in Kerala, and that got quite some attention, there were 17 deaths from this virus. No treatment, no vaccine, but now the good news is, and I'll come back to that, we, there is uh, now a, a research effort funded by uh, a new institution called CEPI. So these are some of the viruses that uh, this century have caught the attention, uh, besides the influenza virus, which by the way kills every year a few hundred thousand people, even without uh, uh, being, causing an epidemic. Now, as you heard, I, um, the first uh, epidemic I was um, involved in was by the Ebola virus. Um, it was in 1976, um, when I was uh, just graduated from medical school and was in training in virology and microbiology, infectious diseases. and. Um, our lab, I was then working in Antwerp at the Institute of Tropical Medicine, we isolated a virus that looked like this, uh, more like a spaghetti or a worm, you know, viruses usually are spheres or square type of, uh, um, you know, things uh, under the electron microscope. But this is what, uh, what we saw, and um, it was the cause of a, uh, an epidemic uh, that was going on in what was then called Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Central Africa. And uh, we, we named the virus, the, the virus was identified as 
something new by a scientist at the uh, American Centers for Disease Control in um, Atlanta because we were, uh, once we saw what this was, uh, we thought it was another, related to another virus, Marburg, and we had to immediately stop all research with it because you're only allowed to work with these viruses in so-called BSL-4 uh, environment. These are uh, very special laboratories where people uh, operate in, in spacesuits and so on to protect themselves and the environment from contamination. And uh, we call the virus after uh, uh, the Ebola River. Ebola is a river that's uh, in central, flowing in central um, Congo, uh, not too far from where the epidemiological the epidemic center was of this epidemic. And we, we protected ourselves as a colleague from Institut Pasteur, a picture we took in 76, and where we were investigating the epidemic. And uh, our goal was to, first of all, to figure out how is this virus transmitted? Because if you confront it with an epidemic, uh, the most important thing to know is what is the cause of it and how is it transmitted? Is this foodborne? Is this the air? Is this sex? Is this blood? Uh, is mosquitoes? Uh, close contact, etc. The, the classic ways of uh, spread of a microorganism. And because as long as you don't know the mode of transmission, you can't really put in place, um, you know, rational measures to stop the spread. So that was our biggest concern. And uh, can we find that out? But it's a completely new virus. Um, and uh, but we found out in uh, pretty rapidly that what was required is very close contact. And by the way, this is how today this was in, uh, in West Africa. How uh, you know healthcare workers are dressed in with full protection compared to uh, in '76. And one of the reasons is that it is. Uh, I'm not concerned for big Ebola outbreaks in the world that spread. But it can be very bad locally, and particularly for the family members and for healthcare workers. Why? Because you need close contact with, um, you know, the body secretions for someone with Ebola. And when you have Ebola virus infection, um, you know, the um, you are uh, you vomit, you have diarrhea, you bleed, and so that's how um, other people become infected. And in um, 2014 and later, uh, Ebola caused the largest epidemic ever with uh, um, 11,000 deaths, 11,000 deaths of 17,000 people infected, including 500 healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, in countries in West Africa that had already a major shortage of uh, healthcare workers. For example, Liberia, uh, a country of about 5 million people, uh, so much smaller than Hyderabad in terms of population, but they only had 51 registered physicians. And, um, and of those, several have died while caring for, uh, for patients. Um, but so, since 76, there were several uh, outbreaks, particularly here in the Democratic Republic of Congo and in neighboring countries. Um, and, and so it was thought, okay, this is something that only occurs in Central Africa. But it changed all, it changed in 2014. And uh, we thought it was limited to Central Africa because this is a, um, a virus that is coming from bats. Also, just as uh, I mentioned for Nipah and for, uh, also for uh, SARS. And that this bat would only occur in West Africa, in, in Central Africa. But it's clearly that we were mistaken. It took, therefore, several months uh, between the first case, which uh, occurred in December 2013 in Guinea, at the border town with the two other countries, Liberia and Sierra Leone, and the beginning of March 2018, so more than three months, uh, no, three, two and a half months, um, you know, delay in terms of diagnosing. And in the meantime, the, the virus spread. Uh, and the reason was that one, you only can find what you're looking for, and nobody was looking for Ebola in West Africa. And two, um, these are countries, two came out of civil war, another one, um, Guinea, out of uh, decades of corrupt dictatorship, so professionals had left the country, and there was no or hardly any infrastructure. So 
So this is a, um, what's now going on. Um, so and then what what happened is that um, the epidemic was not only uh, killing people, of course. Uh, commerce came to a halt. Agriculture came to a halt. Schools were closed. Universities were closed for two years. Imagine. Um, and um, but also there was a lot of societal in unrest. People did not trust what the government was saying. Uh, they killed um, nurses. They killed journalists. Um, and um, particularly if you if I can imagine that you come as a society out of a decade of civil war where people were killing each other because of different opinions or because they had different ethnic origin, um, you don't restore confidence and trust in the state uh, overnight. So when the government said we has there is an epidemic, we have to isolate certain people, isolate uh, entire villages and so on, um, the reaction was this must be a political thing. Um, so it illustrates how uh, epidemics are uh, having an impact and effect um, in the um, society as a whole. The good news, the silver lining on this 2014 big epidemic in West Africa was that um, for the first time there was some research was being done. We could demonstrate and uh, you know, the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine, we were um, you know, involved in um, a lot of research. One that demonstrated that uh, a vaccine that's produced by um, the company Merck, um, Merck Shop and Dome, that that protects against um, this uh, Ebola virus infection. And another one that's uh, produced by Janssen from Johnson & Johnson that's also produced at some different times. It was also therapeutic research, but that didn't show any uh, positive results as yet. Now, at the moment, what keeps me very busy um, is uh, the second largest outbreak of Ebola uh, in the world, in, in, as far as we know, and it's occurring now once again in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in, in the eastern part. When you see here, this, um, you know, this is uh, the border with uh, here is Africa, so it's in the center of Africa, um, and this is a lake that. Uh, makes up the border with Uganda in, in East Africa, and you have also uh, Rwanda here. So here we've got now, um, as of uh, two days ago, we had 927 cases were um, reported with 584 deaths um, in a relatively small area, with the case fatality ratio of 63%. That's very high. Um, the problem is that the epidemic is getting out of control. And the reason for that is in the first place because it's a conflict zone. This part of the world is the richest part in terms of uh, Coltrane. Coltrane is a precious metal that you find in about every single mobile phone, just like cobalt. And DRC, Congo, is also the main producer in the world of cobalt. About 40% all cobalt comes from there. Now, that's not only a blessing, but also a curse in the country. Because armed groups are trying to control the mines, there are conflicts, uh, also a, uh, still a spillover from the genocide in Rwanda, spillover from uh, civil war in DRC. So how do you control an epidemic where the basis um, isolating um, patients, uh, contact tracing, trying to find who in contact, try to vaccinate people when, you know, there are groups that shoot at you. Um, yesterday, again, um, you know, a, um, some militia um, attacked vaccinators because we're using the vaccine. And uh, over the last two weeks, three Ebola treatment centers have been burned down. One by a militia, two by the community. Um, so that is a, a major problem. and that means then that um, half of the cases uh, pop up like this and we don't know whether they're part of a transmission chain. In other words, you know, if you know that I have Ebola, but that um, I have Ebola because my cousin or so has it and I was in contact with that, that makes it quite easy to contain it. But if uh, I come up with Ebola and there's no uh, 
any indication with whom I've had contact and so on, that's a problem. Um, major uh, mistrust of community and for example there were uh, presidential elections in, um, uh, in DRC a few months ago and because of the Ebola outbreak the, the government said that citizens from that part of the country could not vote. Now that part of the country happens to be also uh, a majority for the opposition. So, um, you know, that's the, all these kind of things come together. Nothing to do with public health uh, or with medicine. Uh, we have, it's a border area and when violence uh, is really bad, then people uh, fly and, and uh, run away to, uh, to Uganda. So the neighboring countries are very worried also. And um, we have at the same time, there's now cholera, there's even plague and malaria. And here you can see, uh, this is Dr. Tedros, the Director General of the World Health Organization. Uh, and here is uh, Dr. Jeremy Farah, the Director of the Wellcome Trust, who spent their New Year, New Year's Day, in um, you know, a treatment center uh, in that area to show not only solidarity, but that this is being taken seriously. So Ebola continues. As I said, it is headlines. Um, it's, uh, um, it's really very bad when it happens in your community. And um, I would say for India, I, don't, I would not be too worried. I would be worried about MERS, about SARS, about dengue, about chikungunya, and so on. Um, but for those of you, if there are anybody working in intensive care units or so, it's not a patient that, um, of whom you know that they have one of these diseases that are the problems. The problems are patients you don't know. And, uh, and they could then, you know, infect um, all the staff and so on. Now, as I mentioned, the, 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 after the Spanish flu, the biggest epidemic of our time is the AIDS epidemic. I won't go into much detail. Here the good news is that um, something, a, a new virus that came out of the blue and was, uh, uh, you know, detected, the syndrome was only detected in, in 1981, virus discovered in 1983 and was uh, Nobel Prize was given for those who found it. Uh, um, Françoise Barré-Sinoussi, one of the few women who got the Nobel Prize in medicine, and, um, and um, uh, Luc Montaillet from Institut uh, Pasteur in Paris. Um, but it infected about 75 million people cumulatively. Again, very interesting to think, because here we have a virus that spread through sex. Sex or blood products or from mother to child. But basically sex. It means that these 70 plus million people who are infected are all connected with each other. Because they had either sex with each other, their mother had it, or they had a, an injection or blood transfusion. That tells also a story about human behavior, what's going on and what we don't know, what's going on in the world. And, um, and that makes it double hard to deal with it. Also because there is enormous stigma associated with it, because it's associated with sex. God forbid also with homosexuality and um, so that made it very hard for governments to stand up. You know, India has done a really good job uh, when it came to um, dealing with, with, with HIV because the number of cases has uh, dropped dramatically in all states, uh, was particularly the south that was most affected um, and there was a worldwide mobilization. This is uh, the time my boss was Kofi Annan and uh, the first debate of the UN Security Council was uh, of the millennium was uh, on, on AIDS. And um, it was something that I think the success was a combination of community mobilization involving people who were affected. And we didn't really judge anybody, whether you're a sex worker or a gay man or a uh, you know, drug user. It was to protect people, uh, the public at all. So there was a a major uh, mobilization from uh, at all levels and driven a lot by people living with HIV who were the uh, civil society activists. Um, and that led to a, a real decline in new infections. Uh, as you can see, that started already in 1990. And then in mortality, when uh, antiretroviral drugs, so the HIV treatment, became widely available. And this is where India played a major and crucial role and continues to. And actually, uh, a major part of the of 
people in the world with HIV, and there are about 20 million now on treatment, are treated with drugs produced here in Hyderabad. Produced with antiretroviral drugs, produced, uh, treated with drugs from here. Um, and, uh, and so we know for sure that um, if people, when you stop taking your medication, you die. So you should be proud that uh, Hyderabad business keeps 20 million people alive. That's the truth. However, <coughs> there is complacency. The number of new infections continues to be like 2 million. It's not declining. And uh, in some parts of the world, particularly in the former Soviet Union, parts of China, so the number of cases going up. There is this perception, it's done, we've got a treatment, and uh, we don't have to deal with prevention anymore. Um, and so, whereas um, NACO, um, you know, the National AIDS Control Organization, was really an example for, um, like, other, not only in India, but for many other countries, um, I hope that it can continue its very important work because we know for sure from other epidemics and other infectious disease, if you become complacent, it will go up. And this is certainly the case for something that is sexually transmitted. So don't believe people who tell you that by 2030 this will be over. Now, and then I'll go to the next stage, and that is that one thing that we've seen is that epidemics, they flourish when there is you know, when there are humanitarian crises. Close to here, we've seen it uh, when there was the, the Rohingya from, uh, coming from uh, uh, Burma, from Myanmar, who uh, fled to Bangladesh. And there were major epidemics. You know, here in uh, Cox Bazar in Bangladesh, these are all people who run away to save the, you know, for their life. Um, in, from Myanmar, there were big epidemics with uh, diphtheria, uh, cholera and so on. So that makes it double hard. So it's it's not just a medical problem; it's a societal issue. Now, what have all these issues, all these viruses, in common with each other? And the uh, the answer is they're so-called zoonoses. They all have an animal reservoir. HIV comes from chimpanzee originally. Ebola from bats. Uh, I mentioned um, SARS. Influenza viruses. They come and from various uh, animals, uh, particularly poultry and birds. And uh, that means that we need to think beyond humans when we try to find out are we ready for dealing with epidemics. And uh, whereas overall, and including here in India, the, um, the threat of um, infectious diseases is slowly going down, thanks to vaccines, to better sanitation, uh, the fact that, you know, Households here will have access to clean water. Uh, will do so much uh, against enteric infections and diarrhea and save a lot of lives. However, because there are zoonoses, they are somewhere in nature. Um, we will always have them, of course, um, and that's going to increase. So we need to remain alert for these epidemics. So there is uh, urbanization. Uh, international travel and mobility, climate change I mentioned, conflict, poverty, and so on, and then the food demand and population growth. So it means that we have to remain alert and be prepared. Now, what will the future bring? This is from a, a Belgian painter, René Magritte, who's looking at an egg and tries to paint the bird, what that may come out of it. What will the future bring us? How we prepare? Now, after the epidemic in West Africa, uh, there were several uh, commissions, panels, that were looking at uh, how the world and the countries uh, responded. And I co-chaired one with the was a London School of Hygiene, Tropical Medicine, and the Harvard Global Health Institute. Um, maybe that was the first report that came out. And we all came out with similar conclusions. One is that um, the world is not taking these epidemics seriously and is paying a very high price for it. Um, and that the first priority is that each country needs to be better prepared and needs to have systems so that at least one knows when there is an epidemic will start and by what it is caused. Secondly, the World Health Organization did an extremely bad job in the 2014. It failed completely uh, because of the bureaucratic response, politicized, um, and uh, uh, 
Uh, so that is changed now, I must say. Um, and uh, so that was uh, one of the recommendations. Two, three, is that uh, this is not only for governments, but businesses, communities, people on the ground, uh, all have a, a major role to play, and we need the trust of, of the community. And fourth, um, this is where there is so-called market failure. No company is going to make money with uh, developing a vaccine against Ebola or Zika, uh, Zika maybe, or, or Nipah, because it's occurring, uh, it's actually rarely occurring, so not huge markets, unpredictable markets, often poor populations, um, and yet developing new vaccine costs hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, so how to, and yet we need it. So this is where we need some new systems. Um, and uh, what is the situation? First of all, I would say that uh, uh, World Health Organization, WHO, is doing a better job now. And, uh, uh, and it was tested, and it is being tested in, in Congo. So it's more responsive, a new director general, and all that. So that's, uh, uh, and we need it. Um, two, um, more and more countries are um, getting ready. And there is now an um, epidemic preparedness index. Countries are assessed whether they are ready according to all kinds of indicators that I won't go into. But um, India is uh, scoring uh, moderately well, but it, it, it highly uh, varies um, state to state, uh, so many things. Um, thirdly, um, in terms of influenza, because my biggest fear is not Ebola, it is influenza, uh, it's uh, some respiratory virus that will spread. Um, there is, a, and since 1952, so quite a long time now, uh, a network all over the world, including with the laboratories here in, the, um, you know, in, in, in India, that are um, watching whether there are new viruses, new types of influenza viruses that could cause this epidemic, uh, are being, you know, there's a good network for that. Also, very interestingly, there is now a global insurance system that was established by the World Bank. Um, and what is it? And what's the problem? The problem is that um, epidemics, when they uh, hit poor countries or countries that depend on tourism or trade, um, create a big political problem. When you declare, uh, my country has epidemic excess Ebola, what's the result of that? Fly, airports are closed, the flights are cancelled, uh, you're not allowed to export food, to export this and that and so on. So in other words, you not only have an epidemic, but in addition you're punished because you say you have an epidemic. And so the World Bank has created an uh, insurance mechanism together with some major global uh, insurance companies so that, a, um, that, that countries can take basically an insurance that um, says that um, when you declare your, that you have an epidemic very early on, you have access immediately to money to invest in dealing with this epidemic. And that mechanism was now triggered for the first time uh, for the Democratic Republic of Congo. And it's managed by the World Bank. In terms of um, research and development, you know, something that is of interest to the university, and a research intensive university as a, here at the University of Hyderabad. We established uh, with a number of people a, a mechanism uh, that's called Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation. It was um, government of India, particularly through the Department for Biotechnology, played a major role in the establishment of this together with the governments of Germany, Japan, and Norway, the Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, and a number of pharmaceutical companies, particularly JSK, Johnson & Johnson, Takeda, um, Merck, and uh, also some academic groups, and I chair the initial discussions. So I'm based on the principle that everybody who is part of the solution should be come in, the, in one tent. Now that's very unusual that you have government entities and uh, businesses, particularly pharmaceutical companies, and academia and NGOs all together in one governance structure. That was not easy, there's not always the total trust and we have, have to manage conflicts of interest and so on, but 
nevertheless, I think this can be a new model for um, promoting um, can be health, but can also to deal with all the pollution and the environmental problems we have and what have you in agriculture and so on. And uh, so this coalition now brings together all these players. Money has been collected, about half a billion dollars. The government of India has announced last week that it is launching uh, CEPI as the abbreviation in CEPI, uh, and that's uh, coming out of the Department of Biotechnology to, to support um, Indian research groups and uh, companies to develop vaccines where there is no commercial uh, interest. And that's also, if you want, an insurance mechanism, but it's a, a, um, a push factor. And uh, there are four priorities. One is finishing the Ebola uh, you know, um, vaccine development, but then developing vaccine for Lassa fever, which occurs in West Africa, here in Mers in Middle East, Nepal, uh, South and Southeast uh, Asia. So this is where for, I would say, we've seen for the first time that uh, India, or an Asian country, was actively involved in the setting up of a new multilateral mechanism that uh, also now can capitalize on uh, Indian know-how in the, um, you know, in biotech and in life sciences. And finally, can we predict where epidemics will occur? That would be nice, no? Um, and the answer is not really, but a little bit. This is where new techniques in machine learning and artificial intelligence and um, sophisticated um, surveillance of what's going on, not only in humans, but also in animals, in nature, because as I mentioned, that these are zoonoses, uh, that one can uh, you know, develop models uh, that predict where the highest risk is for occurring occurrence of certain um, epidemics. And this is uh, filovirus, this is a, um, uh, based on the distribution of bats in Southeast Asia. But so we're more and more working on it and, and uh, using these new uh, technologies. Um, so are we better prepared? I think the answer is yes, because we have better diagnostics, we have better governance, politi some political commitment, but that goes up and down. We have insurance mechanisms even, financial insurance. Um, however, compared to 100 years ago, we are now 7.6 billion people, soon 8 billion people on the planet, compared to only 1.9 billion in 1918 for the whole world. Um, mobility is huge. Tens of millions of people traveling, taking a plane. But we also have uh, uh, antibiotics today um, that would kill, uh, that would uh, uh, treat quite a few people because uh, influenza not only kills through the virus but also causes pneumonia which then develops you know into a bacterial pneumonia or antibiotics thing. But what we need is a universal flu vaccine which has now been stimulated and will be part of uh, new um, research programs also here in this country. Now how do these epidemics compare to other problems? And a, f uh, a few weeks ago the World Health Organization published a list of what it saw as the 10 threats to health in the world, the 10 top threats. And uh, very interesting, uh, maybe a little bit less to, uh, for Hyderabad than uh, was at the beginning of the week in Gurgaon in, uh, in Delhi, and I could hardly breathe, uh, and it was not really that bad yet, according to the locals. But air pollution and climate change, you know, air pollution is killing far more people now than infectious diseases. We have the non-communicable diseases, diabetes and so on, that are affecting also India in a big way. We see influenza, we see then something that, what is AMR? Antimicrobial resistance, non-treatable infections. And um, whereas all this influenza, Ebola, and dengue, they're, uh, you know, the zoonosis, but not when it comes to, um, here we have a man-made epidemic because of the overuse of um, antibiotics and of the misuse and the lack of infection control in many hospitals, we have now deadly, untreatable infections. That's right. But also, interestingly, um, uh, another aspect that uh, uh, we don't uh, often think of in our today's world, 
we've reached a stage where vaccines have saved tens of millions of lives. We have all this technology. And yet now in many countries in the world, in 20, um, you know, 19, we see growing resistance and non-acceptance of vaccines. And so it's, the lesson of that is that it's not enough to have technology. We also need the confidence, the trust of people so that they will be used. And that's uh, um, now, according to the WHO, one of the big, um, you know, top priorities. And it results in something that we would never have thought possible. Last year, Europe had more measles. We thought that measles was eliminated than the whole of Africa. Why? Because of refusal of vaccines. And, uh, and, and that's, a, how to say, a paradoxical, if not absurd, situation where we are in an area of high technology, achievements of science, and then yet people refuse. And these are not uneducated people. They're often the most educated people in society. Um, so new uh, challenges for all of us. So to conclude, I think we're, the world is in a better place, but we're still extremely vulnerable because of uh, the reasons I mentioned. And um, I, I think that uh, at the London School of Hygiene, Tropical Medicine, our principle is that we need many disciplines to improve health. And whatever that takes, from a molecular biologist to an economist to a clinician to an anthropologist to mathematicians, we all have them in-house uh, because that's how we will make progress. And that's what also the university can do. And uh, uh, I I'll end with an ad here for two of the books that go deeper into this on the one hand, the relationship between science and politics is, uh, and the pu public trust, and on the other hand, the story of the discovery of Ebola and so on. Thank you very much for your attention. Very happy that uh, Peter has agreed to take a few questions. Usually, distinguished lectures, uh, Vedanta don't ask questions. But we're very happy that Peter has agreed to take a few questions. Uh, if somebody has a question, can you be loud, please? Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. First of all, I would like to thank you for such a great lecture, sir. So uh, my question is, uh, apart from uh, all these problems of poverty and uh, population, uh, do you think that improper and uh, like you know not a very good regulation and handling of the healthcare system in some of these African countries has probably contributed to the uh, such rapid uh, spread of uh, such uh, viruses like Ebola and others? Yeah, it's certainly true, and that's not only in uh, African countries that, um, you know, if, uh, first of all, uh, as I mentioned, one of the, the top priorities for dealing with epidemics is to have a system that we call public health uh, system. That means laboratories that can diagnose, you have surveillance systems and all, that, knowing what's going on, and that's not there. And actually, also, this country depends on the state. Some states have really very good systems, others not. Um, and then uh, in terms of the um, training of uh, you know, all the healthcare workers and professionals, that's also very important. Yeah, I think that a healthcare system that takes care of all citizens is absolutely essential, not only to deal with epidemics, but it's probably going to be extremely uh, important to find good solutions when, uh, as a country, as a nation, we, you, everybody will have to deal with these chronic conditions. Uh, an epidemic that's short-lived, but uh, diabetes and hypertension and all that, that's, that's for life. You have to deal with it. How are we going to deal with that burden? In the UK, the National Health Service is really struggling because of this epidemic of combination of obesity, diabetes, hypertension, uh, alcohol uh, abuse and, and all that, mental problems uh, all in one so your point is well taken thank you thank you sir uh, professor uh, professor uh, uh, professor uh, excuse me 
Uh, professor, as a bioinformatician, I would like to touch upon the fundamental uh, 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 primary structure of uh, the epitopes of Zebo or Zebo virus or T cells or B cells or even AIDS because just last week I got the opportunity to meet uh, Cooper, the inventor of T cells, B cells at Anna University. And so uh, essentially it has been proven that uh, non-numbers are of significance either be it of core peptides or seed peptides because uh, anything less would be more uh, uh, random, anything more would be, anything less would be more uh, random and anything more would be more uh, stringent or, or vice versa. So um, uh, it has been beautifully established uh, using the big data genetic code I presented Polish Academy of Sciences that uh, uh, the Zebo uh, entropy maximum is 38.88 and uh, 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 it's equivalent with uh, Thomas Peterson's uh, 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 information content formula from DTU is 43.2. Uh, okay, okay. So, question? Professor, yeah. Uh, yeah, professor, yeah, question, so, Professor, the question is uh, 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 why uh, the, the maximum entropy has been uh, stipulated for these uh, epitopes, that is, as 38.88 uh, for the non numbers uh, 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 of the uh, uh, epitopes in the protein primary structure. Uh, because because these these works are proved these have these works have been established at National University of Singapore and uh, Johns Hopkins University and they also have a US patent on it. So, uh, yeah. sorry, I don't uh, understand the question. So yeah. just very, we can talk about it. Can you meet sir oh. after? Yeah, yeah, we can talk about it. Yes. So thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. I have uh, to point out that uh, while uh, discussing the conflict part of the challenges to the public health, uh, not much attention is given globally to understand the causes and solutions for what can be termed as the governance in the regions of limited statehood. And this is becoming more and more complex getting less and less global attention and I have a feeling that if you look at the history of these epidemics, they have actually originated in the first place in such zones of the globe. Yeah. No, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's, uh, I write quite a lot about it also, but, um, and uh, let's put it this way, um, good governance is really important to, to deal with, I mean, health in general, but certainly with acute crisis like epidemics, but viruses thrive on um, inequality, on um, corruption, on, um, you know, on, on conflict and fault lines in society, and, uh, and also on the vulnerability of people, because there's another aspect, and that is that uh, often stigmatization and discrimination are also making it very hard to deal with epidemic, and I think there uh, the HIV epidemic has been a, a, a very strong, a strong example. But certainly, when you just take um, Ebola outbreaks, they're all occurring, uh, well, nearly all uh, in countries, as you say, sir. So I, I couldn't agree more. And uh, that's again why, um, at our school, we dealing with epidemics. We not only have social scientists, but also political scientists trying to see what can, not only to analyze, but what can you do about it. But there is a limit as academics what you can do, because then you get into the real politics. But it's a very important point, thank you. Uh, I, I would like to ask the question that, uh, considering that you said that there was a large mistrust of vaccines, especially in like, uh, very educated countries, let's say Europe, and I would I, I would like to ask that even after them like being raising awareness and stuff, why is there such a you know fear or yeah. mistrust of such? Yeah, I think there are many different ways, and I'm not a specialist in it. Uh, my wife, uh, Professor Larson, she's a world specialist in this uh, area, and uh, maybe you can uh, say a few words about that if you can give a. a microphone, but uh, it is a very complex uh, uh, area. It depends on, um, well, here, yes. Maybe, Annie, you can say a few words. Uh, I don't have an easy answer to that one, <laughs> but it's clear that information alone, education, even um, otherwise good health, uh, sometimes good health makes people too confident sometimes too much education creates a bit of hubris that we know better 
Uh, but sometimes also it has to do with a political standing. You can be in a either marginalized or you could have a religious or a philosophical belief. We have a very strong uh, movement of people who are wanting to, um, it's somewhere between anti-globalization and anti-technology who want to go back to nature, go back to, um, you know, the real basics, uh, forgetting the fact that when we were before technology, there were a lot more children dying, there were a lot more. So it's something that's more ideological than straightforward, which um, is, a, is a huge challenge uh, for the public health and medical community whose whole way of modus operandi uh, operates within a, a a system where you expect that more education uh, would lead to more rational acceptance. Are there no questions? Uh, if there are no questions, uh, I request uh, our Vice Chancellor uh, to felicitate uh, our uh, Guest of honor today, distinguished guest. Uh, can I ask? Uh, Request uh, Dr. Anita to deliver a vote of thanks, and after this, we'll break for high tea just outside the No, they will put it in the pack. Oh, yeah, yeah, great. Yes, because of the delicate food truck. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my honor and privilege to propose the vote of thanks. Anita. So, on behalf of the organizers, I thank uh, Professor Baron Peter Payet. Director of London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine for delivering this wonderful lecture and enlightening us and enriching us. Thank you very much. I thank Professor Larson for her gracious presence and for having taken time out to be present here. I thank our Vice Chancellor, Professor Aparav Podili, for his gracious presence here and for welcoming the distinguished speaker and our guests today. This distinguished lecture series would not have been possible without the generous endowment fund of uh, Insurance Regulatory Development Authority of India. I thank the chairman for the generosity he has extended. We have a committee, the distinguished se lecture series committee. I thank all the steering members for their effort and for their constant support. Thank you, each of you. I thank the Dean's School of Medical Sciences Professor Prakash Babu and Senior Professor Gita Venuganti for their constant support. I also thank all our guests who have come here from eminent institutes, universities, colleges, and centers. I thank each of you this for your presence here and thank you very much for taking oh, your time so out of your people. busy schedules. I think so, more than uh, 400 were there. The Dean. Mm -hmm. School of Life Sciences yes, for extending mm, his support. No, I count by with the number of the auditorium capacity which has state of the art and over 100 thank people you. were standing around. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thank Professor Shamanagaru for having taken the initiative and all the effort to make this distinguished lecture happen today. Thank you, sir, and I think he deserves a round of applause. I thank all the faculty colleagues 
I thank all the staff, the school the scholars, the students, and some alumni who are present here today on this occasion. Thank you very much for your presence. I thank the press and the media and request them to give a wide positive coverage of these events henceforth. And last but not the least, I thank each one of you present here and thank you all for making this event happen in a successful way. She's the faculty at School of Medical Sciences. Okay, okay. She teaches there, okay. public health. Oh.